Hey there again. This is going to be a rather brief video. This is going with week three. It's the informative style guide. So here are some things that you should keep in mind as you are preparing and delivering an informative speech. The first one is objectivity. So what I want you to remember is that for an informative speech, you should avoid persuasion at all costs if possible. There will be some sort of innately persuasive items. So if you're talking about something we can all agree upon that is a bad thing or a good thing, then you might be sort of seen as persuading us to believe it's bad or good. But again, if that's the consensus, you're okay. But what I don't want you to do is to say things like, we should do this or we need to do that, they ought to do this, this needs to be fixed, that sort of stuff. If it needs to be changed, then just give us the facts and we can arrive at that position by ourselves. We don't need you to tell us explicitly to do, change, alter something. Uh, just show us what's going on, the facts, and then we can make that decision. Another key thing here for it being informative or persuasive is using a conversational style. And what I mean here is just not talking at your audience, but talking to them. And so that can be tough in a virtual setting, but keep your tone and your pace in a very conversational way and that can really help you connect with an audience more. We'll talk more about that as we get to persuasion where it's so vital that you connect. But for an informative speech, just try to remember that this isn't a, um, a speech in front of some royal party or a, a, you know, a, a public figure. This is you teaching your group something about your topic. That's all we're looking for, but do it in a clear way. Now, when you think about um, verbal delivery, there's a few things to keep in mind. First of all, clarity is key. Instead of using, you know, flashy words or, you know, trying to show off how smart we all know you are, just focus on being clear above all else. And the way to do that is to think about who this audience is. So we all know that we're, we're intelligent people, but we all have somewhat different interests. So therefore, don't use jargon that might only be used when talking about your topic because you don't know how many other people in here are familiar with your topic enough to get the jargon. All that might do is confuse people when they don't understand the words that you're using. If you're not sure about your audience, use about uh, 10th grade level language and that's a safe bet. That's not to insult anyone's intelligence. I know you're smarter than 10th graders. Uh, but the idea here is that if we speak on that level, everyone should be able to get it. One crucial thing is to use correct words. Um, that's pronunciation and that is the actual word itself. So we all probably have a friend who uses a word that isn't quite what they think it is, or they'll, they'll use it just in the wrong way. I had a friend in high school who would say facetious, which is, you know, sort of... Um, sarcastic, facetious. He thought it meant serious and mean, basically. So it's the opposite of facetious. I told him once, I was like, hey man, that's not the right word. He blew it off, so I just didn't go back to it. Just, okay, that's fine. Um, so, you know, be aware of using correct words that are what you think they are. There's a lot of words out there that people use frequently that aren't correct words. I mean, I'm thinking of Comfort, comfortability, I can't even say it because it's not a real word. Comfortability. So people are talking about how comfortable they are. Comfortability. Like, what the hell is that? This Comfort. Comfort. Don't make it harder than it has to be. Uh, so use correct words. If you're not sure, look them up. And avoid biased language. Now, of course, you'll, you'll avoid biased language like slurs and, you know, gender, racial, religious, backgrounds, ethnic. You, you're not going to use any of that. We know that we're, we're in agreement there, but some words from the past are a little outdated now. And here's sort of your, your exclusive language list. As you see it here, I'll let you look through it. I will point out some, some highlights, but whenever you have man after something like most of these words, it implies that only a man can do these jobs because in the past, that's the way it was. So a policeman is now a police officer, fireman, firefighter. Um, anchor man is an anchor, weatherman, meteorologist, you get it. And the, you know, the idea here is that we live in a more inclusive world now, and these words reflect that in a way that the old words did not. So they are more correct now. 
when I teach this in class, sometimes people say, why are you policing our language? Um, this is PC, but I don't have to be PC. <clears throat> you don't. You don't. Um, but what I will tell you is if you're giving a presentation somewhere, let's say at a job interview, which many jobs now have presentations, um, and you use one of these dated words, and somebody there that's making a decision about your future doesn't like that, you may have just cost yourself an opportunity by just not being inclusive, right? So even if you don't really care, other people do. And that's what matters most is what that audience will think when you speak. Now, beyond just these sort of sex roles in terms of jobs, we have gender. So him, her, he, she, his, hers. We all have you know different pronouns. A lot of people will put those in their emails and uh, that kind of stuff now. If you're not sure, them and they is your sort of safest option. Um, old terms like homosexual, we don't even use that anymore. It's a medical term from the 1800s that um, really probably shouldn't be a medical term at all. So now we just have the LGBTQ community or gay man, lesbian woman specific terms. Um, there are people who are intersexed. I hate it when people are on TV and they say, well, there's only male and female. There's only two options. Actually, there's not. First of all, that's what they mean to talk about is gender when they mean masculine, feminine, two genders. There's more than two genders. That's indisputable. But when it comes to sex, they say, oh, there's only two usually, but there are people who are intersexed and they have both sets of organs. Um, so just be careful with that sex change versus gender confirmation surgery. Um, one is sort of this forced change while the other is confirming what you already know. Um, girl and boy versus woman and man. How old is the oldest boy or girl? Not a trick question. It's 17 because when you turn 18, you're a man or a woman. So if someone's over 18, don't call them girl or boy unless you know them very well and they don't mind. Then when it comes to things like race, most people would say like a black man or a white woman, that kind of thing. You, why? It doesn't matter usually. Uh, unless there is a very specific reason to bring up race and you can clearly identify it, that's just not, right? Kind of, kind of works best that way. Again, unless it's salient to what's being discussed. Same thing with um, gender for the most part. Now, what about the nonverbal elements of delivery? It's important, and this is for informative and persuasive speaking, that we have eye contact. Eye contact lets the audience know that you are being honest with them, that you are socially attracted to them, and that you're paying attention to them. Now, let's break that down. Uh, for honesty, you may have heard things like, can you look me in the eye and tell me that from a parent? Well, the idea in our culture, at least, is that if you aren't looking someone in the eye, you're kind of looking around, you may be lying because you're breaking eye contact. That's not the case in other cultures, but in ours, it is. So make sure that you're making the eye contact to be believable. For social attraction, this doesn't mean physical, sexual, sort of romantic attraction. This just means a liking, like I like you. You, you, seem, you strike me as a good person. And making eye contact with someone will help you achieve that. And then last, of course, is the attention factor. When you, when you pay attention to someone, you look at them. Now, how do you do eye contact? In a real setting, in a live setting, scanning the room is important. Bouncing between your notes and the audience is important. For you, you need to remember the camera is the eye contact. So look at that camera, come back down, grab some notes, and go back up. Now, there are obstacles to this, and especially in a live setting, anxiety is a big deal. And that may be for you here, but at least you have the option to re-record. Um, if, if it's poor preparation and you just have to read it because you don't know what material is on here, that shows through in both virtual and live settings. So don't let that be a problem with you. Now, what about movement? Again, very different virtual world and live world. For us, we know that movement communicates attention uh, or it gets attention because people want to see what's moving and it, it shows confidence because you're able to control a space. For us in this virtual setting, we're not going to be able to do that very much. So we're going to make sure that we want to, uh, first of all, avoid distracting movements, you know, sort of this, this swinging back and forth and that whole deal. We don't want to do that. We want to sit relatively still. Um, we can shift around a little bit here and there, you know, moving in, coming out, maybe turning to the side just for a moment. That's okay. We just don't want it to become distracting. And that's that's the key thing. A little bit of controlled movement shows that you're confident and comfortable. 
too much uncontrolled movement shows that you are nervous and you are way out of the element. So practice that natural conversational style with movement too uh, while you're practicing the speech. Now, gestures vital as well because they show attention, confidence. They work as illustrators. I mean, think about if someone was in your home right now, wherever you are, in, in whatever room or, or, or location you're at, wherever you are, Imagine somebody's there with you and you need to tell them how to get to the nearest restroom. Now try to do it without your using your hands at all. It's tough, right? You, you just go up the steps that are right there. And then when you come out the top, you're going to turn to the right. And then you're going to walk toward the front door. And before you get there, I want you to turn to the left and that'll be the restroom. But if we can use our hands, we would say, yeah, just go right up here. Just go right up these steps, come out to the right. And it's right there on the left it makes life so much easier. And that communicates through a speech with our gestures. So control them, be in, be in control. Don't do the Ricky Bobby. If you've never seen Talladega Nights, he just holds his hands up. Um, it doesn't mean you have to direct the choir and keep gesturing the entire time, <clears throat> but instead be purposeful. So if something small, show us small. If it's big, show us big. If it's moving, show us movement of some sort. Match your gestures and your hands. You can do one, two, three. You know, the, the first thing I need to tell you, now that you know that, let's move on to this. You can, you've got options here. We do these again naturally in conversation, so don't let that natural use fall away because now you're giving a speech. Whatever you do, don't hide your hands. Now, that's not a big problem for us. The, the issue for us is going to be gesturing below the camera frame. So don't forget that sometimes you may just need to put a little more space between you and the screen so that we can see your hands and that you don't have to hold them up here to gesture. So that's going to take some playing around with your, your machine and distance and cameras and all that. See where you get. Now, if you were doing a live speech standing, there are things you should avoid. I'll tell you these just so that you don't do it in the future. But you've got the fig leaf, which is putting your hand straight down in front of you like this, but you know, down at your waist. It looks like you're wearing a fig leaf over your person. Um, you've got the chicken wing, which is sort of holding your, your hip. You don't want to do that. You've got the flesh wound where people will get frozen like this. Um, you've got the wall off where they'll sort of block things out. And then the note statue where they'll stand here and they'll just hold their notes and they never move that note hand. That's it. So avoid those things at all costs. Be natural. For your voice, there are a lot of elements here that are nonverbal. This is very important for virtual speaking because in a live setting, it can be hard enough to understand people sometimes. In a virtual setting, it's even more difficult to understand people because there is this different layer of, of distance between us. So the way we need to think about it is in these terms. For volume, are we able to hear you in the back of the room? Or for virtual speaking, can the mic pick you up? Remember, if I can't hear you, I can't grade you on something. I can't give you credit for a thesis statement that may have been there, but I couldn't hear it. You know, um, So be careful with that. Your audience can't hear you. They can't be informed or persuaded. So you, know, you don't need to whisper or scream. You just need to be uh, audible. That's all we're really looking for. Also, maintain the volume of your, your voice throughout an entire sentence. Sometimes, in a, especially American speakers, we will drop off the volume at the end. Drop off the volume at the end. Just, all right, just falls off. Um, a lot of English or British speakers will go up. You know, we just drop off the volume at the end. And that's sort of the opposite. We don't need to go that way. We just need to be sort of maintained so that we can hear all of the words. As far as rate goes, don't speed through it. I know a lot of people get nervous and they wanna go as fast as they can to get it over with. Don't, don't do that. We don't need you to crawl, but we don't need you to you know, sprint either. Now, when you get nervous, you are more likely to speak faster. So if you are one of those folks, know that you are, and then prepare for it by speaking slower on purpose. And then once you sort of get into the groove of the speech, that'll all level out and you should be speaking at about the right pace. Whatever you do, make sure that you are sort of focused on projecting this idea of competence. 
competent speakers speak fairly quickly, but not too quickly. And it's been shown over and over again that that's, that's what people like the most. They don't want someone, you know, talking like they're a baby. But they also don't want people going so fast they can't understand what they're saying and they just want to go for blah, blah, blah. So find that, find that happy medium. Now, with your pitch and inflection, please avoid monotone. Avoid monotone. Um, you know, in our natural voices, if something exciting happens, we know our volume rate, pitch, go up. If something's not so great, our volume rate and pitch go down. It's natural. We do it all the time, every day. Don't let that get away from you because you're now in this new atmosphere of speech giving. Right? You want to make sure that you keep that the way it, it needs to be. What I'll say also about monotone is that most people think monotone and they think, okay, I'm just going to talk like this the whole time. But I honestly hear more monotone speakers in a high register. And so it'll come out like, okay, and the one thing that we need to understand is that we all need to understand that we should do this thing because if we don't do the thing, like it's, it's still monotone. That's still a monotone voice. So avoid monotone voices. They will put people to sleep or they will turn them off from listening to you. Last thing I'll say about pitch and inflection is when you're wrapping up your speech, if you want to, you could use what I call the news reporter approach. So if you think about if you have a, a field reporter from your news station working on site somewhere and they sign off, they don't say, you know, for CNN, I'm Carl Brown. From CNN, I'm reporting from uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, I'm Carl Brown. Instead, it would be reporting live from Grand Rapids, Michigan, I'm Carl Brown. And it's that da 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 Da, 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 da. That is some way that you could finish your speech. So remember, if you don't want to pay over twenty thousand dollars for a partial plane trip, you might want to lay off the sauce. You know that sort of thing. Um, so it's an option that you have. You don't have to do that, but if you're having trouble, um, that's that's sort of a workaround. Last but not least, absolutely, the vocal fillers or vocalized pauses which is the, uh, um, er, like, you know, so you know what I mean? That sort of stuff. Try to avoid that. Now, listen, the only way to know that you do this is to listen to yourself, record yourself. Most people who do it don't know that they do it, especially as much as they do it. It's really problematic if you do it at the beginning of sentences and it's repetitive. So starting every sentence with, and, um, so, and, um, you know, it's important that we, um, you know, work on pitch and inflection, and um, we want to avoid, you know, uh, a monotone uh, style because like that, no, stop, stop, that's too much. If you have a few of these, it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. It's, it's only a problem if they become distracting and people are now paying more attention to the vocalized pauses or the, the vocal fillers than they are the actual speech. It is better to have a silent pause, just nothing. Just take a minute, take a beat, and then move forward. But again, it's not terrible to have some of these. Just don't let them be distracting. Make sure you watch yourself so that you know if you have that issue. All right, that is the chapter on informative speaking. What I will say here is that I hope you were able to apply some of this to your speech, but don't forget the speech lab uh, cons consultation um, for the tour is due this week. Now, the next week you will have your speech lab consultation for the informative speech due. So make sure that you're staying on top of this. Practice at the speech lab. Practice um, uh, with your yourself or with maybe roommates, whoever. But as always, if you have questions either now or as you're practicing, send me an email and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Otherwise, I will see your outline soon. Have a great day.